If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have noticed that this episode is a week delayed. But if you want to get early access to our episodes, consider becoming a paying member. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you for all your support. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Eternal Damnation. Oh, colloquially referred to as hell. <laughs> I'll be your host, Tom Nash, somewhat predictably. Uh, before you ask, no, there is no air conditioning, but there will be good music. I'm obligated to read to you from uh, Revelations 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which sounds inappropriately scientific. In addition to this, we have a very special guest here for your induction to hell tonight. Someone to help gently lower you into the warm bath of perdition. A man whose life's work will indeed be immortalized in the discipline through which we all understand the nature of our reality, science. One of the very few people on earth that made me proud to be homo sapien. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise the roof for Professor Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Was that all right for you? Well, um, it's truly a privilege to be sitting with you here today. Uh, yet with great privilege comes great responsibility, and I do have a responsibility to ask the hard-hitting questions and dig deep. So to begin with, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? That's a very easy one, the egg. In a way, that's the whole message of the selfish gene, that, that the, the replicator came first, and the chicken or the body, the dinosaur, the human, the panther, is a way for an egg to make another egg. So, yeah. The Absolutely. egg came first. It came first. We've sorted it. Uh, well, it is truly an honour to have you back here in Australia. I know that uh, one of your earliest mentors, uh, Mike Cullen, was it Michael Cullen or Mike Cullen, had moved here to Australia in 1976, I believe it was in Melbourne, and you recounted in your biography that you gave a eulogy for him and you spoke about the last day that you spent with him having run into him at a, a party sort of by accident. Yes. And he took you uh, out to see earthworms and penguins. Yeah. And uh, that really struck me. And I, I had a couple of questions along with that. Uh, what, can you touch on your relationship with Mike, the importance of having a mentor in science? And also, uh, do you find Australia, like Mike presumably did, to be a sort of fascinating island of diverse ecology? Uh, he was um, Nico Tinbergen, who was my supervisor. He was his right-hand man. And Nico Tinbergen was a Nobel Prize-winning biologist. But by the time I joined his group, it was really Mike Cullen who was kind of carrying the group. And uh, although Nico Tinbergen was my official supervisor, Mike Cullen was my unofficial supervisor. And he was an immensely generous person with his time. Uh, he would, unlike many distinguished scientists, he didn't put his name on the papers of his graduate students. His graduate students wrote the paper on their own. I mean, he gave them an immense amount of help, but the authorship was theirs alone. And so he never achieved the recognition that he deserved because he didn't um, take the credit for all the work that his students did under his supervision. He was immensely generous. And he left uh, Oxford to go to, to Monash so if there's anybody from, from Monash here, they might remember him. Um, he would have been, I'm sure, just as generous there. I last saw him in Victoria, and I, um, as Tom says, I met him at a party. I was giving a talk, I suppose, in, Mon in, in Melbourne, and he came to this party, and it was just the same as before. I loved him very much. We went, he took me down past the place where these giant earthworms, huge great earthworms. I don't know whether you've seen them somewhere south of Melbourne. And then we went and studied, had a look at his penguins. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. He was an incomparably great scientist, although he didn't get made fellow of the Royal Society or anything, because as I say, he let his students take the credit for what they did rather than him, him taking the credit. And so I think I'd like to pay tribute to his memory. And is that why you regarded him as a mentor or were there other things that he facilitated that just he, he fell naturally into that role for you? Well, he, he, he was a mentor. He was a mentor to lots and lots of people. Who, as I said, he, he didn't take the credit for being the mentor. Hmm. I mean, um, so you worked, uh, actually, uh, not, not too long after that, you worked as an assistant professor in Berkeley. Is that right? California? Yes. Was it late 60s? Yes, late 60s. An interesting time to be in Berkeley, California. It was the time of the 
demonstrations against the Vietnam War um, and various other things, and I took part in those rather fully, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, you you did say that you've admitted to never having partaken in any psychedelic drugs. Is that correct? Were you yes, afraid of? Uh, that, that is correct. Uh, were you afraid of having a religious no? The experience? honest truth, I was never offered any. I mean, it just. <laughs> Where was I back then? Did you ever put a flower in the in a rifle? I w witnessed people putting flowers in rifles. Yeah. Yes, I was I was there, and the gang that I was with were putting putting flowers in the ends of of, of yeah. the rifles. Because that's the iconic thing that you always think about. That, yes, it is. is. Yes, yeah. Um, we're going to get on to talking about animals a bit. Before I ask my first animal question, and don't worry, there's not too many, but please tell me about the time. We got the uh, car here together and I looked at Richard's tie and he said, well, yeah, you can ask me about that on stage. So I have absolutely no idea. What I can see is a hybrid between a crocodile and a duck and it's called a... It's a crocoduck. It's, a, it's an emblem of um, American creationists have various very weird ideas and among their very weird ideas are that if evolution is true, then there ought to be a crocoduck and a, a mixture between any species and any other species you care to mention. They kind of got a little bit wrong there. They haven't quite got, they've got the hang of what evolution's all about. So the crocoduck is a kind of symbol of creationist idiocy. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of dogs, okay? And, you know, you hear about dogs that uh, have jobs you know they work on farms they detect bombs or they save people from burning buildings there are also dogs that show great empathy towards humans they stay by their master uh, by their grave once they died and all that sort of stuff if you were to invert all of those sort of benevolent and fastidious attributes of those dogs and inverted them that you'd come close to describing my dog right he's pretty useless he's very cute he's an italian greyhound his name is caesar and even though he's really cute, if I'm being brutally honest, he's rather stupid. At times he's selfish and he's extremely capricious, the dog, right? I love him, though. I would take a bullet for him. I kind of love him like he's my own species. And now you've done a lot of work on reciprocal altruism and kin selection. So how would you say the idea of kin selection and recipro reciprocal altruism plays a part in interspecies altruism that I feel for Caesar? keeping in mind that he's not paying me any rent. I'm not surprised that you take a bullet for him. I, I, I think that it is perfectly possible and plausible for humans to love dogs as much as they love humans. And I think you can mourn a dog when it dies with as much grief as you can mourn a human. It might sound slightly eccentric to say that, but I, I believe that in many cases. Kin selection, well, kin selection is about gene survival. Uh, natural selection works uh, on the level of the gene. Those genes survive, which take what steps they need to take in order to survive. And in the case of kin selection, what this means is that genes program individuals to behave altruistically towards other individuals who are statistically likely to contain copies of the same genes. Because that way they're actually looking after themselves, looking after copies of themselves. And so this is why Animals take care of their offspring, and it's why they take care of their nephews and nieces, their siblings, and in the case of social insects, that's a very important part of it. So that's kin selection. Now, kin selection between humans and dogs, no, absolutely not. It's, it's nothing to do with it. Dogs are a different species, uh, and it's far too distant uh, for kin selection to come into play in a direct sense, but in an indirect sense, because after all, the human brain cannot be expected to be cognitively aware of kinship. Natural selection programs the human brain to behave altruistically towards, towards other individuals who are statistically likely to be kin. It doesn't mean they know they're kin. So it would be something like the rule of thumb might be, in the case of a bird, look after anybody else who is brought up in the same nest as you. That would be the rule of thumb which stands for kin kinship. Well, in the case of humans, uh, I think it would be not unreasonable to say that somebody who, who arouses your love might be in a state of nature, might be kin. And so although a dog manifestly is not kin, the rule of thumb gives you the ability, the tendency to be empathetic towards, to be, to be loving towards 
um, other individuals, even if it's a, a, another species. Dogs are, as you know, they're, they're domesticated wolves. And whereas wolves do not, on the whole, arouse in us the same feelings of love and empathy, this is partly, perhaps even mainly, because dogs have been bred to look like humans. Dogs have been bred... We've inadvertently, accidentally selected dogs to have human facial expressions. And they look at you with that hangdog expression. You can use the word hangdog. Dogs have been naturally selected to look like humans, to behave like humans, to look guilty when they've done something they shouldn't, that kind of thing. So, Are you trying to tell me that I look like Caesar? <laughs> okay, uh, interesting point on that. I mean, that might have answered my follow-up question, was, which was that, um, you know, why do we feel more empathy for a dog that we've never seen that is in pain over, let's say, a cockroach? Yes, I think that cockroaches are not beautiful in no. human eyes and they don't have human expressions like dogs. There's all sorts of reasons why we don't feel empathy towards cockroaches. I don't think I feel empathy towards any insects in that sense, really. I mean, I'm, I'm deeply interested in insects, but I, I don't feel that the same kind of empathy to, towards them. Is there any link between, I mean, human beings and homo, homo sapiens being a kind of a generalist type species where you might have conversely a woodpecker that it has, selects for its ability to peck wood and humans in a sense have to be a jack of all trades. You know, we, we have somebody in our tribe who's a good fisherman and somebody who builds, you know, how, however it goes. That generalist type of approach to our evolution, do you think that might have evolved something in which incorporates empathy for other species because we don't know how and why they may be cooperative or useful in the future. Certainly wolves have been, and, and dogs do as well. Yes, I can't see quite that that will work in that way. I think in the case of, of wolves becoming dogs, I think what happened there was, I follow Coppinger, who, who um, produced this theory that w what happened was that wolves, like many carnivores, wolves can be scavengers. And so individual wolves might have scavenged the middens, the, the rubbish heaps of human settlements. And those individual wolves who were most bold in the presence of humans, the, who were least likely to run away when humans ran at them and threw stones at them when they were pilfering the rubbish dump. They were the ones that survived well on the food that rubbish dumps gave. And so there was a natural selection in favor of boldness in the presence of humans. Any animal has a kind of uh, balance between approach and withdrawal, approach and, f and fleeing. And uh, those individual wolves who were heavy on the approach side in the presence of human rubbish dumps would have been favored by natural selection because they had this excellent source of food. And gradually they became tamer and tamer, more and more ready to approach humans. And then perhaps, uh, perhaps wolf cubs were adopted by children or something like that as, as pets, and so they gradually became domesticated in, in that way. I think that's probably something like the way it happened. Interestingly, Coppinger makes the point that when dogs go feral, when they go, go wild, they don't revert to being wolves. What they become is not wolves but dingoes or village dogs. So uh, this suggests to Coppinger that in the domestication of the dog, this self-domestication of the, of, the, of the dog from wolves, they went through a long phase of being not wolves at all, but something like dingoes. And that's, when, that's what they revert to now when they go feral, when they, when they disappear from human um, habitation. Okay, so wild. if you take a domesticated dog and you take it out into nature and you sort of let it run wild, it becomes like Well, a, it doesn't, it but like it's, it's offspring. I mean, it's, 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 okay, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's descendants. Do yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's interesting. Fantastic. I've always become interested in uh, peacock tails uh, and as discussed by Wallace and Hamilton in the model of um, selecting for male beauty within the peacock's tail. Yes. It, signifying health uh, via beauty, I guess, or via expense. Well, that's, that's one theory, yes. Yeah. Um, so that which is great expense to the male peacock being alive and healthy despite the ostentatious tail, that being, is it Hamilton's theory? So in the modern context of Homo sapiens, many elements of attraction can be signals of desirability, I guess. Uh, for example, uh, proxies for wealth or the ability to bear healthy offspring. Yet considering how some of what we consider attractive today can be kind of de rigueur or ebb and flow with fashion trends, it suggests that there's a cultural element to attraction. How then does culture play a role in sexual selection by something like fashion? 
Why do you always bring up humans all the time? I don't know. <laughs> Much more interested in peacocks, sex, Richard, actually, than, than, than humans. Let, let me go back to peacocks first, because, okay, he, yeah. because you only mentioned one of the two dominant the theories. Okay. Um, and when Darwin invented the idea of sexual selection as opposed to natural selection, and the peacock would be an, a sort of I iconic example of that, but peacocks pass on their genes successfully because peahens like peacocks that are, that are brightly coloured and um, gaudy and, and have this huge, great, great fan. For Darwin, it was sufficient just to say that females like that. And interestingly, Wallace, who was the co-discoverer of natural selection with Darwin, hated that idea. He wanted there to be some usefulness element there. That's where your idea comes in, that it's a badge of health. And this has become one of the main theories today, that what peacocks and similar things, Bird of Paradise, are advertising is good health. Females are behaving as good diagnostic doctors and they are choosing males which are most healthy. And the peacock's tail is a badge of health because only a really healthy peacock could afford to carry around this great big handicap of a big tail. This handicap theory was due to an Israeli zoologist called Zahavi. Zahavi rather liked to anthropomorphize, and he would say things like, um, if you have a woman watching a, a race between two men, and she's going to choose the one who, who wins the race, and one of them is carrying a sack of coal on his back, but they come in as a dead heat. She chooses the one with the sack of coal on his, on his back because obviously he must really be a faster runner, even though he didn't actually, even though it was a, a dead heat. So that's the idea of the, of the handicap principle of the, of the peacock's tail. Now, in the case of humans, humans are a very, very abnormal nuisance of a species. They don't succumb easily to evolutionary theory for all sorts of, of reasons. And you're quite right that there's a, a very strong cultural element in everything that humans do. And so, I mean, for one thing, in, in humans, it's the wrong sex that does the highly colored advertising. It's the wrong sex that plays the role of peacock. In general, in the animal kingdom, it's the male sex that carries the bright colors, the equivalent of lipstick and fancy hairdos and things. But in, in humans just do the wrong thing. And you can, you, you can make sense of it. I mean, you, that, you can make a, make a case for that. Mm. But um, one of the parts of that case would be, as you say, a cultural influence. Mm. Speaking of culture, you, you coined the term meme. Does everybody know that here? Like three of you? Who was that? <laughs> uh, which was, you defined as something that conveys a cultural unit. Um, yes. Of transmission or a unit of imitation, I guess. Uh, its current colloquial definition is a uh, widely shared cat video. Um, not officially, but mm. yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the way in which this term has been adopted or even hijacked, I guess, by the internet? And what ways, if any, does it give credence to the original? Well, it's a, it's a special case. The, the, um, the idea originally was, is... The, the correct idea is that natural selection favors replicating information. In, so anything in the universe which is self-replicating, any self-replicating information is potentially subject to a form of natural selection and therefore evolution. And at the end of The Selfish Gene, my book, The Selfish Gene, I wanted to, having devoted the rest of the book to extolling the gene as the dominant replicating information in nature, the unit of natural selection in Darwinism. I wanted to make the point that it didn't have to be the gene. Anything self-replicating anywhere in the universe is potentially a, a unit of natural selection and hence evolution. And I speculated that if you go to another planet and find life, you almost certainly, indeed I say certainly, find that it's Darwinian life and therefore there will be some equivalent of DNA. But then I said, maybe we don't need to go as far as another planet. Maybe we've got some equivalent of DNA already emerging on this planet. And that would be a cultural unit of inheritance, a unit of cultural inheritance. That would mean a unit of imitation. So anything which jumps from brain to brain by the mechanism of, of imitation, like a clothes fashion, a tune, a, a craze at a school, a craze for a particular kind of toy at, at a school, anything that is imitated and spreads like an epidemic through the population or spreads from parent to child in a cultural way is potential 
fair game for a form of natural selection. I wanted a name for the analog of the gene, and I called it a meme, um, which is kind of vaguely sounds similar. It doesn't quite rhyme, but almost, and it's de derived from a Greek word meaning imitation, my meme. And so that's what a meme is. And it has come to mean to anybody under about 30, um, it's come to mean, I think, a, a picture with writing on it. <laughs> And th this is a, a very restricted subset of a, of a meme because it, it does have the property of self-replication. It does tend to spread through the internet and it's, it can also mutate, which is another important part of it because you get that variants of, of the same um, internet meme s spreading. Can a meme be judged by the extent to which it proliferates? The extent to which it... It proliferates. Yes, you know I mean? definitely. Yeah. Um, that, that would be, some, uh, just, just like some genes are more successful than others in spreading through the population, that's what natural selection is. So some memes are likely to be more successful than others. If we take tunes, for example, a tune which uh, is very catchy, and the very word catchy, it carries the meaning. A tune which is very catchy spreads through the population. People whistle it, and they hear another person whistling it, and they whistle it or sing it. And so it spreads like an epidemic. The same is true of clothes fashion, like the reverse baseball hat, that kind of th thing spreads as an epidemic. And it's funny thing is, when, when I first saw people in Britain wearing baseball caps, I thought, that's funny, lots of people seem to have been to America. I was totally naive about the fact there was actually a meme spreading. Yes, yeah, so proliferation would be a, a criterion for... Well, the first thing that happens is it, it just arises, and then if it's successful, successful means in a Darwinian world, successful means that it spreads proliferation is exactly what it is. And so anything, I mean, it's interesting where we draw the line between something that is a meme by, by which we know it now is essentially a collection of zeros and ones, but we can also regard as, I mean, extensions of ourselves, let's say, or extending our lives or modern medicine. Uh, would you say that our ability to extend our longevity or modern medicine, things like that, could they be regarded as a small internal cog in the mechanism of evolution? I wouldn't say so, no. I, I see what you're getting at, but I think it's a, such a different process. Um, it certainly could enhance longevity, as you say. It certainly could make you live longer. It certainly could um, improve the quality of life. Uh, it, and, but I don't really want to call it an evolutionary change because it, it's non-genetic. It, I suppose in, in a mimetic sense, it might be evolutionary because you could imagine that in a thousand years' time, if we came back, we could see people going around with, with iPhones built into their heads <laughs> and, and controlled by thought waves. And that would be an, an, an enhancement in some sense, an enhancement of life. But I wouldn't want to call it evolution in the same sense as a change in leg length or, or ear size or something of that sort. It, it reminds me a bit of uh, Marshall McLuhan, who used to talk about um, technology being an extension of us and just as a spade is an extension of our hand, in a yes, way. Yes, yes. You know, our smartphones can kind of be an extension of us, and it connects us to a digital world of, you know, knowledge yeah. and all of that sort yes. of stuff. I think it's entirely right to call it an extension. I mean, that, mm. that, that, that is realistic. But uh, maybe I'm being too much of a purist and saying I, I wouldn't regard it as an evolutionary change. I regard it as a, as a, as a cultural change. But it it's kind of mimics evolution in a way. Mm. So if you were to take that idea further and, and let's just sort of imagine 50 or 100 years down the track and we implement uh, technology you know, within ourselves, maybe we get chips in our brains or something like that, and we become more, I guess, cyborgish, for lack of a better um, way of putting it. Uh, at what point would you draw the line between what is part of you and what is not, what is an extension? Just biological? Is that the way you draw the line? Well, I'm not sure that I would bother to draw a line. I think it's up to you whether, whether you want to draw a line. As a Darwinian, the line to me would be a genetic change, and it certainly isn't that. Um, but it's, you could say something like clothes are an extension of the, of the body, and clothes clearly evolve in a, a kind of a way, but it's a non-genetic non way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a Chinese, uh, oh, it's on the topic of this, a Chinese biophysics researcher who goes by the name of He Jin Kui, I believe, if I've butchered that, my sincerest apologies. And he has uh, edited the embryos of a, cu a couple of twins with CRISPR uh, so, so that they're sort of resilient to HIV and a host of other things. 
Now, where do you stand on the ethics of genetically modifying human beings? I'm not sure about ethics. I think it's, uh, in a way, a pragmatic problem. I think, yes, I, I wouldn't call it an, an, an ethical problem. I, I think there are grave risks to doing things to human beings, genetically modifying human beings. But I think I would think of it as, as a practical problem, one that needs to be taken very, very seriously in the same kind of way as we need to take very seriously uh, any, um, well, an introduction of a foreign species into Australia, for example. People introduce rabbits into, into Australia with disastrous results, as you know. I mean, that, I wouldn't say that was an ethical thing, that problem, that's a, that's a, almost a, a political thing. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, and so uh, also if you started being able to choose the gender or sex of your baby, yes, um, if you put that responsibility in the hands of the people having um, the children, you could have a... That, that could have disastrous results because in, in, certainly in many cultures in the, in the world, if you allow, if, if you put into the hands of people the power to determine the, the sex of their, their babies, um, there are many cultures in which there would be very few of one sex and lots and lots of the other sex. Yeah, exactly. And um, that could be, well, you can see what would happen then. Absolutely. I kind of think uh, the way that I thought about it initially was I got quite excited about it because if you could edit a gene, uh, sorry, if you could edit an embryo such that it was a genetically modified and disease-resistant human being, I guess it's a, it's a different way of vaccinating someone. I mean, we vaccinate yes. kids right now. Um, I think it's pretty hard for anybody to object to that kind of um, genetic modification where you eliminate a hereditary disease. I think if, if somebody talked about um, taking steps to eliminate, I don't know, haemophilia or something like that, uh, which causes nothing but misery, then it's very hard to see how anyone could uh, object to that. But it's also once the cat is out of the bag, technologically speaking... It's also what, sorry? Uh, once the cat is out of the bag, technologically speaking. Yes, you're thinking of a kind of slippery slope. I, yeah. Y yes. The people have much more p problem with uh, positive breeding, you know, breeding <laughs> for musical genius or breeding for mathematical ability or something of that sort. A lot of people have, get, get very queasy about that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, and I think if you had, uh, it's kind of like the going to space thing. You know, people can go to space right now. It costs about $400,000. So not many people can afford to do it. But until a lot of those people do it, it won't get cheap for everybody to do. And so you might have a period in which only really wealthy people are able to edit the genes of their kids. And so you have a small amount of the population that are resistant to a bunch yes. of things. They could be tall. They could be good looking. They could have eye colors, you know, whatever it is. And that would actually isolate people who weren't genetically modified. Yeah. That's another very profound objection uh, to the whole idea, yes. Mm. Um, speaking of ethics, I was going to talk about religion for a second. Only a very short time soon. Neil Francis of the Rationalist Society, Australia, I'm not sure if you're aware of him, recently published a report entitled Religiosity in Australia. Part four, which is coming out soon, discusses findings related to charitable donations made by religious versus non-religious people. The report actually found that even though the hard evidence supports the headline claim that Australia's religious volunteer and donate more than the non-religious do, these donations occur overwhelmingly in respect to their own religious congregations. Um, and I mean, I think that's what we kind of all expected, right? And so... I think it's the kind of report that would encourage good conversation and inform policy as to whether these kinds of religions should get any tax benefits or charitable status. How would you structure that moving forward? Well, I think that it's right that charities should get tax breaks and to the extent that they do charitable work, that's correct. What happens in Britain and possibly in Australia too is that uh, religions, religious organizations get an automatic free pass to tax, tax breaks and they hardly have to um, justify it at all. I mean, when I founded a, a charity in Britain called the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, I had to jump through a lot of hoops in order to get charitable status and I had to answer a question like, kindly inform us what benefit science confers on humanity. Um, Whereas if I'd said that it was a religious organisation, it would have just sailed through without any questions being asked, and that, that is what happens. By the way, I think it has to be a monotheistic religion. I always wanted to persuade a Hindu organisation to take it up as a test case of uh, <laughs> polytheism. Do you think you could like, impose some sort of a regulation on a religion such that only a per the percentage 
of money that they actually give out to Goodwill is tax deductible when they receive it? Well, I suppose you could do that. There'd be howls of protest, of, of course. Um, it's a perennial question that, that people who are atheists get asked is, is, you know, why? what motivation would you have for being good? What motivation would you have to being altruistic, for being charitable? And uh, I, I think that's rather a, a, a cynical question because I, I don't imagine, I, don't, I, I would like to think that the re reason people are good and altruistic is not just that they are, I don't know, sucking up to God or, or, or something, but as to the question of whether um, religious people are more moral, for example, than atheists, um, I'm aware of one study. I'm not quite sure how authentic it is. I, I read it as in, a, in a scientific journal. It was an experiment on cheating in exams. And the, these were students who were given, an unknown to themselves, they were given the opportunity to cheat in exams. They didn't know that they were being watched. And they were divided into categories, whether they were religious or non, or not, not religious. It was, it was very religious, slightly religious, agnostic, and um, not, not, not very religious, and then atheist. And the only group who did not cheat were the atheists. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was suggested that they were so intelligent they didn't need to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Were you in that control group? Or? <laughs> the placebo effect has a lot of hard evidence supporting its efficacy, right? And when we think about it in the medical context, you know, there are things where uh, studies that have found that if pain tablets are yellow, they're more effective. If people pay more money for them, they're more effective. Is this sort of dangerously close to being able to justify pseudoscientific medicine? It's a very good point, and, and it's a point that my colleague Nick Humphrey has made. Homeopathy, of course, doesn't work. It can't work. But nevertheless, the placebo effect is real. And um, so uh, if you go to a homeopathic doctor who prescribes you nothing, um, <laughs> Nevertheless, you believe, because the pill is yellow, whatever it is, you, you believe that it, that it works, and so it does work. That's the, what the placebo effect does. That's why medical research is done with a placebo control. But now you raise this point, if the placebo effect does work, then maybe homeopathy can be justified because, after all, real doctors don't have time to devote a whole hour to talking to a, to a patient. They, Ten minutes and you're out. Whereas a, a, a homeopathic doctors have nothing better to do. And so, and so um, they give you a, a, a nice long time and it's a, it's a nice kind voice talking to you and saying, yes, I'll give you these yellow pills and they'll make you better. <laughs> and the placebo effect kicks in. So maybe that's how it, well, and I'm sure to the extent that that's how homeopathic medicine does work, if it works, it, it is a placebo effect. And maybe it can be justified. Um, one finding which Nick Humphrey also told me, which I find very, very hard to believe, is that the placebo effect works even if you know it's a placebo. Now, that's really very, very odd. Yeah. And I think that needs explaining. It does, yes. We had a, a case, yeah, an interesting case here in Australia. I'm not sure if you heard about it, but uh, Nurofen, which is an ibuprofen brand, was, had all different sorts of Nurofen. So it was Nurofen for period pain, you know, Nurofen for migraines, Nurofen, it was a whole series of, and they all had different price points as well. And they were found to all have exactly the same ingredients and the same amount. And they were forced to change it, to remove those things from the market, which I think was probably a mistake, you know, because if you gave someone Nurofen period pain and they actually thought, no, I, I want the period pain one because I believe it's going to help me. If it works, it might be as good as that. And uh, Rory Sutherland always always makes the point of like they shouldn't have gone they should should have gone one step further, which is Nurofen for people whose neighbours like reggae. Right? Yeah. Okay. When, when I said, by the way, that homeopathy doesn't work, it, the, the, the reason for saying that, of course, is that the control, the, the placebo, which you're comparing, if you do a double blind trial and you compare a homeopathic dose with the, with the control dose, since they're identical, in one sense, it cannot work. But the get out that they have is that, is that they say that the water, that they dilute it. You, you, you know what they do, they, they dilute and dilute and dilute and dilute and, so that there's only one molecule in a volume of water the size of the solar system, that, that kind of thing. Um, so that it, there is, is in effect no, no molecule left of the active ingredient. But what they say is that the water has a memory and clearly there's no evidence for that. But if they could demonstrate that, 
they would get a Nobel Prize for physics as well as for medicine, because they would have demonstrated an entirely new force of physics. But of course, they don't do that. What they do is just collect anecdotes. Uh, but it is true that there is this faint possibility that they, that they claim, which is nonsense, that, that water has a memory. And you could control for this. If you do, want to do a really, really rigorous experiment, double-blind experiment, you would subject both the control dose and the experimental dose to the same amount of what they call succussing, which is, which is um, shaking and diluting and shaking and, and diluting. The only difference being whether you put in an, a drop of the original stuff in one, one or, not, or, the, or the other. That's the experiment which ought to be done and which King Charles III, who's a great homeopathic enthusiast, should finance. Um, I have a, a, a rather uh, esoteric question that I was sent to me, and I have kind of mentioned this to you before the show. And uh, I just want to inform the audience that I have absolutely no idea what this question means, but I really want to hear Richard explain it to me and us, us all together. Um, I mean, you better phrase it very carefully in that case. If oh, you don't know Jesus what, yeah, Christ. Yeah. You're already intimidating. Don't put me under more pressure. Well, the reason that I, I came up uh, with the idea of asking something around this was because being in Western Australia here, uh, we're in the same state as the, the Pilbara area, which is um, where they have found some of the oldest evidence of life on Earth in stromatolites. And I have a friend who kind of had lived up there and worked on it, and I asked her what might be a great... Uh, line of questioning for you. And she said something about very early life. And so please uh, bear with me for a second. Um, and I will ask this question. And then I want you to explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old, because in many ways I am. Uh, the site, uh, evidence for early life points to microbial communities in mar marine and hot springs as back as far as 3.5 billion years ago. Work on the or origin of life by Dean Mer, Sozak, and many other concentrates on the formation and selection of populations of protocells in an ancient version of Darwin's warm little pond. Preliminary work on protocell and polymer self assembly in wet, dry environments suggests that groups of primitive protocells could form a kind of network assemblage which would be capable of adaptation and growth before the complex machinery of living cells emerged. So as Carl Woese summarised, this progenote could be the transitional from carrying the simple and initially random sequenced nu nucleic acids and peptides toward the coherent living cells capable of reproduction through fission. Genes in this scenario could be nothing more than short templates shared horizontally with the progenote, yet still supporting a Darwinian process of selection. How does your concept of the selfish gene into such a prebiotic scenario in which genetic material uh, and products would be, in a sense, owned collectively by a community of as yet undifferentiated protocell entities. I hope you all got every word of that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I don't... I mean, I, I haven't visited the stromatolites um, in Western Australia. I would love to do so. They are very similar to fossil remains of the very earliest forms of life. They're bacterial mats. And um, I mean, I can talk about the origin of life and speculation about the origin of life. I can't talk about all the details which, which your friend wrote down for you, <laughs> um, because that's just a, ve a very specific I idea for the or origin of life. The, the general solution to the problem of the origin of life is, is we know what it's going to look like. It's going to look like the first self-replicating entity. And it probably would be something a lot more primitive than a bacterium. These stromatolites are actually mats of bacteria. We're not really talking about bacteria when we're talking about the origin of life. We're talking about something, some sort of naked gene, perhaps some sort of self-replicating entity which was not yet cellular, which didn't yet have a, a cell wall around it. And the key is replication, because once you have replication, once you have an entity which you could call, call information, a protogene, then you have natural selection can get going. Because once you've got a, a proto-replicator, that proto-replicator can make erratic, erroneous copies of itself. That means there's competition between different versions of itself and competition for ability to replicate. That's what it does. And so some varieties will replicate more rapidly than others, more successfully than others, and the world will tend to become full of the more successful kind of replicator. 
there is a so-called catch-22 problem in the origin of life, uh, which is formulated in this kind of way. If DNA was the first replicator, then DNA requires protein in order to do its replication, and protein requires DNA in order to be made. And so you can't escape from that catch-22. A possible escape from it is RNA. RNA is related, is similar to, to DNA, as you know, but it is capable both of self-replication, like DNA, and also of being an enzyme, being a, being a catalyst. And so if RNA was the original replicator, then you have both functions, both the replication function and the enzyme function all in one. RNA is not a very good enzyme, it's not a very good replicator, but it can do both. And so the idea is, the idea of the RNA world theory is that DNA usurped the replication function from RNA and protein usurped the enzyme function. And that's when it really started to take off. But the, the stromatolites, uh, which you can see in, in Western Australia, are way down the line from there. They, were, they would have been much more, they are much more advanced than that. Would that support the idea that perhaps if we did find life on another planet, it wouldn't necessarily be DNA-based, but it would probably operate within a, in a, a sphere of natural selection? Yes, that's, I, I strongly think that. I, I'm, I'd be very surprised if it was DNA-based. I think that would be too much of a coincidence. If it was DNA-based, then I'd be even more surprised if it had the same genetic code. I'd eat my hat if that were the case. It, it just conceivably could be DNA, but with a, a different genetic code. But I'm, I would put my shirt on it being Darwinian life, and therefore on there being some kind of genetics, probably not DNA, probably not RNA, but something. Uh, interesting questions then would be, would it be one-dimensional code? Would it, be, would it even be digital like, like DNA is? Mm. Or could it be analog? I suspect it would have to be digital because that is required for, it for, for us to get sufficient um, stability, to, to, uh, high well, fidelity. And also, I guess, uh, I mean, I've always thought that if you were to run into alien life, to be able to traverse the kind of distances it would take to travel you know, in, in between galaxies... Um, you would think that it would need to be something very robust. That it, very... Yes, because it, if we ever meet it, 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 it will have to come here yeah. because we don't have the technology to get to go there, so to speak. Yes, so there'd be a kind of one-way kind of yeah. valve that uh, would have to be pretty sophisticated to get here. Don't call us, we'll call you. No. Yeah. So w would you say that li if you had to pick between inevitable or accidental, how would you describe life as we know it? That's very interesting. Not many people would say inevitable. Uh, the Cambridge paleontologist Simon Conway Morris says it's inevitable and um, even thinks that something like humans is inevitable. Other people think that we may be the only form of life in the entire universe. And it's very hard to disprove either of those suggestions. Um, if we are unique in the universe, if there is literally no other life anywhere in the universe, then that means that the origin of life, what we were talking about just now, has to have been a colossally improbable event because there are so many planets in the universe, even in the galaxy, such a colossal number of universe of, of, of possible planets where life could have arisen. But if it did arise only once, and that means that the process that gave rise to it, the origin of life on this planet, was stupendously improbable. So improbable that we'd be pretty much wasting our time speculating as to how it happened, because we'd be looking for not a plausible theory, but a highly implausible, a vanishingly implausible theory. Because if it was anything other than vanishingly implausible, then the galaxy would be crawling with life. And I don't believe that for a moment. I, so I, I therefore do think the galaxy probably is crawling with life in the sense that there's probably lots and lots of life around the galaxy. However, again, the number of planets is so large that there could still be lots and lots of separate life forms arisen in the galaxy. And yet they might be so spaced out that none of them ever meet any of the others, and, which is in a rather sad thought. It would be very about... exciting to, to encounter another life form. If we ever do encounter it, it, it won't be, I suggest, it won't be bodily. We won't encounter them bodily. We'll encounter them by radio. And the SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence by radio, seems to me to be a worthwhile un undertaking and worthwhile uh, su supporting. 
Um, could it be, and I don't want to end on it because we don't have much time before we're going to go to Q&A, so get ready, but could it be that life as we know it inevitably, speaking of inevitably, ends up destroying itself and it could be part of a cycle that, that does that over Well, that has been suggested that, that one of the reasons why, one of the answers to Fermi's question, where, where is everybody, why haven't we encountered them, why don't, why don't we pick them up? It could be that there is a very short interval between a civilization reaching the stage of being able to broadcast radio waves, which is what we would need in order to pick them up, a very short interval between that milestone and blowing themselves up and destroying themselves. It could be that all around the galaxy there are little civilizations winking into existence and then winking out again in geological time very shortly, maybe only a couple of centuries between developing uh, to a stage where they can transmit radio, which is when we would pick them up, and developing to the further stage when they blow themselves up. Um, so there's a little, little window of opportunity, little winking lights of civilization around the galaxy. And that's a rather pessimistic uh, answer to Fermi's question, where is everybody? Well, it's about time to send it over to you guys to ask some questions. I'm going to forego the rest of mine. We have two microphones on either side of the room, left and right. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, I'm sure there's quite a lot of you, please leave your seats now and head down the side. But what I want is a boy-girl, boy-girl fashion. Can we do that, one after the other? Can I get some feedback here? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Okay, so some people over here, some people over there, and um, switch it up if you can. Questions for Richard. No, ladies, it's a bit of a boys' club down here right now. Okay, can we start with you, sir? Uh, hello, Professor Dawkins, it's a privilege. Um, in your experience of debating issues of religion and supernatural beliefs, what has been the most effective methods or arguments that cause people to see the fallacies in these beliefs? I haven't a measure of effectiveness. I am not the most diplomatic person in the world, and I, so I tend to rather just... Um, I've been accused of just putting it out there and not using any powers of persuasion. I've been told that... It's no good telling somebody you're an idiot. Um, and uh, I get that. The sort of orthodox answer to the, to the question is to meet them halfway and say, well, of course, I understand where you're coming from and uh, I, I've sympathised with your point of view, but had you thought of this? And I, I guess that probably is the most effective way of doing things. And it just isn't quite my way. Thank you very much. Uh, Ma'am? Uh, I'll let you guys know on the sides, the, the question people as well. We've probably got somewhere in the re in arena of eight a side. So if you're like the ninth and tenth person along, don't get your hopes up. Yes, ma'am. What is a woman? That's a very easy question to answer. A woman is a female member of the species Homo sapiens. Now, I realise that there could be a grey area here. Um, there could be um, intermediates. And what I'm thinking of there is, what would you say about a female member of the species Homo erectus or Homo habilis or um, Australopithecus even? I think I would be very happy to call a female member of the species Homo neanderthalensis a woman. Homo erectus, a female member of Homo erectus, I'm not sure I'd call her a woman. Maybe, yes, I probably would. Australopithecus, would, was, was Lucy a woman? I'm not so sure about that. So that there are grey areas, but within uh, modern living, non-extinct uh, individuals, a woman absolutely clearly is a female member of the species Homo sapiens. You're up, ma'am. In, in your opinion, what is the purpose of life? Right. This is get, they're getting very specific now. What is the purpose of life? As a biologist, the purpose of life is the propagation of self-replicating information, which on this planet is DNA. And that is a uh, surprisingly straightforward answer. I mean, it, it's a true answer. It's, a, it's the correct answer. Speaking as a biologist, however, speaking as a human being, the purpose of life is what you make it. And uh, it certainly isn't in the forefront of any of our minds that the purpose of our life is the propagation of DNA. I don't think it is. I mean, even um, sex, sexual desire, the ultimate reason for sexual desire is propagation of DNA. But that's not why we have sexual desire. We have sexual desire as a psychological proclivity. And it, natural selection originally built it into us because of propagation of DNA. But it's something that we feel 
we don't have, have any deliberate, uh, any direct connection with that in, in our minds. And similarly, we set up all kinds of purposes in our lives. A purpose to finish writing a book, which is my purpose at the moment. A purpose to, to finish, um, to, to put on a good performance if you're a musician, to score a goal if you're a footballer, um, etc. There are all kinds of purposes which are very worthwhile, very important purposes which each of us have. They are what make life actually worth living, I think. Um, the fulfillment of these purposes, which are different for, e for each one of us. So the, bi the biological answer is a definite, I won't say straightforward, it's a, it's a definite answer, which is the propagation of DNA. But the, the personal answer is something that each one of us has to answer for ourselves. Monsieur. Thank you, sir, for taking my question. There's a bit of a joke. We can't find the missing link, but it's still walking around among us. Are you satisfied with the evolutionary process from Homo sapiens and Homo erectus, et cetera, et cetera, to where we are now, or do you think there is a missing link between current humans and evolutionary humans? Well, the, the phrase missing link is a 19th century phrase, and uh, it, it, was, it dates from a time when there were no fossils. And now we have a, a, very, a really rather rich fossil record uh, of um, hominins. We have also molecular evidence about the, uh, the dating of our common ancestor with various creatures like the common ancestor with chimpanzees and, and bonobos is about six million years ago. The fossil record from that common ancestor and to modern humans is pretty rich. If we go backwards, we go through Homo erectus, well, various sorts of archaic Homo sapiens, then Homo erectus, um, Homo habilis, um, various species of Australopithecus, um, Ardipithecus, um, Ororin, Sahelanthropus, and so on. So, yes, there are no missing links anymore. They've all been, there's, there's a pretty continuous uh, record, foss, fossil record. Missing link is a totally outdated concept. Go for it. It's a delight to see you, Dr. Doc, uh, Dawkins. I actually have just uh, two questions. One would be regarding your radical view of, and radical skepticism, I would say, uh, relating to religion. And the other would be your view on Dr. Peterson. Uh, yeah. For the first, like I just recently saw this documentary, I think it was a Nat Geo documentary in which they told that there's around 200 billion planets in this galaxy and around 300 trillion galaxies. And the, the cosmic value of us being here is like inexplainable. It's, it doesn't add up with values of numbers. It's, it's just... Either it's, there are many of us all out there or there are none of us. But just even with the process of evolution, the amount of coincidences that needed at each stage with the brain, with our bodies and with other animals intermingling with each other, this is just extremely, extremely rare. And we're the only ones we can know of. So with such information out there, I understand being an agnostic with a scale of five from one to 10, and you've referred to yourself, I think, as a nine of uh, being atheistic. Why such radical skepticism when there is so much information out there that would just totally be against that stacked up altogether? And the second would be, you've done an interview with Dr. Peterson. What do you think about that? I don't understand the, the rationale for, for saying that, that because of all these huge numbers of planets and, and, uh, and uh, stars in the galaxy and galaxies in the universe. I can't think what on earth that got to do with, uh, with belief in supernatural creator. It it's, it's, seems to me to be um, a total, um, I mean, it, if, if there is a supernatural cre creator, he could have created us uniquely or he could have created millions of, of different places. And so the, the argument is a separate one having nothing to do with it. Dr. Peterson, I presume you mean Dr. Jordan Peterson. I have met him once. Uh, we had a, a two-hour-long conversation in Oxford. It was a somewhat one-sided conversation. Um, uh, and um, one of the words that I got in edgeways was with respect to his belief that uh, DNA, the DNA double helix, is some kind of Jungian archetype and primitive um, art uh, indigenous art from around the world reveals that primitive hu humans uh, had already got some knowledge of the DNA double helix by looking into their own cells. And I think I contributed the one word bullshit. <laughs> Thank you. Ma'am? 
Hello. Um, I would like to know, does the selfish gene benefit our planet or will this be our undoing? Sorry, I didn't quite get the, but the selfish gene... Does this, will the selfish gene, from a human perspective and an animal perspective, well, does it benefit our planet or will it be the undoing of our planet? Well, the selfish gene is uh, a concept explaining evolution. It, what it means is that the, the gene is the unit of natural selection. And so um, it really is the basis of all life. It doesn't mean that we're selfish. It doesn't mean that we ought to be selfish. It doesn't mean that we are selfish. It doesn't mean that we evolved to be selfish. The book, The Selfish Gene, is actually largely about altruism. Now, uh, the question, does it benefit the planet? Well, it, if, if it does, it, the question devolves to, to the further question, does life benefit the planet? Because it's the basis of all life. And, well, life has been going on this planet for rather a long time. Um, let's hope that we don't destroy it. But if we do, it will be us, and not specifically the selfish gene. We are just one of uh, millions of species that are all produced by the natural selection of selfish genes. Life is um, definitely what makes this planet interesting. Yes. So I guess it is for the good. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Let's get you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the, uh, the opportunity to ask this question. I'm a great fan of yours. Self, uh, the selfish gene changed my life, I think. Um, my question is this. Uh, a, a colleague of yours, I think, at Oxford University, Bernard Reynolds, once wrote in 1987, words to the effect that although we don't think there was an aquatic ape, we do think that moving through water acted as an agency of selection in the evolution of humans in our past. As somebody who studied the so-called aquatic ape theory, which I prefer to call waterside hypotheses, for 25 years, and this is why I came to Australia, I just wondered what you really thought about the idea. It seems to me that you've sat on the fence a little bit about it. I know that you've met Elaine and you know that she's not talking about mermaids, and she's a, she was a wonderful woman. I just wondered if you could tell us what you really think about the idea. The aquatic ape hypothesis was originated by Alistair Hardy, my old professor at Oxford. Um, he delayed uh, announcing his theory until after he retired, I think because he wanted to uh, make, <laughs> salvage his own re reputation or something like that. Uh, <laughs> it was taken up by Elaine Morgan in a big way, and she wrote a number of books about it. It's a plausibility argument, and there's a certain amount going for it. I must confess, I rather took against Elaine Morgan's advocacy stance. She, she cared so passionately about the theory that she would only ever talk about positive evidence for it and never, never evidence against it. The idea really is, is the following, that at some point in human hominin history, and it's a little, left a little bit vague when, we're not really quite clear from the proponents of the theory when they're talking about, perhaps you, sir, would, would enlighten us on that. Humans went through a, a phase of being aquatic or at least living on the seashore, and the, the circumstantial evidence for this is things like our hairlessness, the fact that we have a, a thick layer of subcutaneous fat, which other aquatic animals have, and various other things like having hair on the top of our head, which might have been handy for keeping the sun off our heads when we were swimming around, and um, various other pieces of possible evidence. It's not taken very seriously by biologists or anthropologists, and much to Elaine Morgan's annoyance. I think Alistair Hardy always had a bit of a tongue-in-cheek about it, in his case. I, Desmond Morris had a sort of soft spot for it. I have a slightly soft spot for it. I don't think it's probably true, but it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your question. That was great. Go ahead. Uh, welcome back to Perth, sir, and uh, it's good to see you again. Um, and, and just as a, a bit of a brief comment, I hope that the homeopathic quote unquote doctors are incorrect because the way we're starting to reuse wastewater nowadays, I don't want that memory. Um, however, onto the, onto the question. Um, this one's kind of double barreled, but li listening to Sam Harris and, and a lot of um, other intellects discussing artificial intelligence, we know that at the moment it's more machine learning and pattern recognition, but when artificial general intelligence comes along, I was just curious, first of all, if you have any views on how you would see that evolving, considering that it's... Uh, a human invention, so to speak. And the second part is, how come you're not wearing odd socks anymore? I think that um, th what interests me about artificial intelligence is the potential for the future and the possibility of it raising really difficult philosophical, even ethical questions, um, whether 
um, it would be possible for an artificial machine, an artificial program to become conscious, to be have emotions, to have feelings, to be capable of feeling sadness, feeling fear. These are, I think, profoundly interesting questions because philosophically, I am a naturalist. I believe that the consciousness which each one of us has is a product of brain physiology, a product of brain stuff, a product of the activity that goes on in the neurons in the brain. And that means that since it's physical, it must be possible in principle to replicate that same behavior in silico. And therefore, it must in principle be possible for an artificial machine to be conscious and to have fear and sadness and things like that. And that raises ethical questions about whether you would be doing moral wrong by switching it off or something like that. So that, that's what interests me about it. We live in a time when the technology of artificial intelligence is advancing by leaps and bounds. And so that is a very exciting time to be living in. It's also rather a frightening time. Some people are frightened about having their jobs taken away from them, about um, an eventual usurpation of the human role altogether, and maybe that we should be supplanted by the machines that we create. Uh, it could be that in a thousand years' time, there'll be a hall full of silicon robots looking back on a time when life consisted of soft, squishy, wet things like us. What would it take to convince you that an AI was conscious? It's a very hard question, and, and Alan Turing um, pr proposed the, yes, the, the, test, yeah. the test of, of having sitting in a room with a, with a, in his case, in his year time, it was a teleprinter, and you could had to interrogate the entity in another room, and, and, and if you could, if you were unable to tell whether it was a human or 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 a, or a computer, you had to conclude it was intelligent, and um, that somehow doesn't quite seem satisfying. But it, it's um, I can't come up with it, but I, I could imagine that if I I don't know, had a conversation which was a fully open-ended conversation, not limited to some domain. I mean, al already we have machine intelligence which can converse plausibly, fool you that it's a human if it's about a, a, a limited domain, like moving coloured bricks around a table or playing chess or something of that sort. But to talk about your holiday, your love life, your pets, your where you went, where you were going to tomorrow, if, if it were really capable of having a conversation which was indistinguishable from the conversation you would have with a, with a human, I think it would be very convincing indeed. Mm. Disconcerting and convincing. Um, yes, sir. Tom Nash, he talked about uh, immortality. Mr. Dawkins, I, I, Professor Dawkins, I just wonder, you certainly will be immortal for your works, but in uh, this day and age of technology, it's almost like a shot out from the future generations. Have you considered freezing yourself? Uh, <laughs> In the remote chance you can't rule it out to gamble. Then you that could be Richard Dawkins. <laughs> <right now. laughs> and if not, why not? I planted that guy. Well, I'm 81, and I suppose you have, you know, I'd have to face up to this fact. I do not think that living forever would be a very appealing prospect. It's, uh, I, 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 I don't, I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I could probably cope with about 200 years, I'd rather like that. But uh, a million years, no. That would be, um, if, if, you, if you could imagine yourself going on and on and on and on and on in w eternity, what's frightening about the idea of eternity is fact, the fact that it is eternal. And eternity being a frightening thing in itself, I think the best way to spend it is under a general anaesthetic. <laughs> And that's what's going to happen. That's actually um, not a bad point, though, so integrating that with what the gentleman said. What if you could sort of sleep through a millennia but just wake up intermittently for snapshots? It, it would be, so it would be very uh, interesting to satisfy curiosity. I sometimes wonder what, just not a, not a millennium, but just a couple of centuries, and suppose that Charles Darwin were to be reincarnated and, and to see a car, I mean, or a, or a, a mobile phone, a, a computer, a plane... It would be bewildering. And the same, I suppose, would happen if we were to come back in 100 years or 1,000 years. It'd be intriguing and frightening at the same time. Absolutely. Yes. As well as female peacocks, um, us humans often find the plumes of male peacocks quite beautiful. And it's often said that the best way to calm down a dog during a thunderstorm is to play at Schubert or Mozart or something like that. These are all like 
aesthetically pleasing but otherwise useless to the, the creature ideas or concepts. But they seem to be sort of, I don't think it's unreasonably unreasonable to say, applicable across the board in terms of life to be aesthetically pleasing to them. So do you think that uh, evolution has created a sort of universal aesthetic which selects for organisms that appreciate the beauty in things? And what, do you, what consequences do you think that has for the theory of evolution? I think it's unlikely to be a general universal thing. It has been suggested, uh, there was a man called Hartshorn who suggested that birds have an aesthetic appreciation of beauty in their song. And I do think there might be something in this because if you look at the way birdsong develops in the individual, in many species, and this has been looked at especially in chaffinches and white-crowned sparrows, um, what happens is that the bird teaches itself to sing by listening to itself. And so it kind of sings at random as it's learning to sing. And those phrases of the random song which fit in with a built-in template, or it may be either a built-in template or a template that's been recorded by the bird in very early life through listening to its father or a member of the species, but anyway, there's the template, which is the, the concept in the brain of the bird as to what its song ought to sound like. And so it then sings at random. It kind of burbles away at random and learns to repeat those fragments of song which fit in with the built-in template. Now, what is that but a kind of aesthetic sense? It's, it's saying, in a way, I am the, I'm anthropomorphizing now, but... The purpose of the song is to impress a female, okay? The female is a member of my species. I'm a member of my species. Whatever turns me on is likely to turn the female on. Therefore, what better way to perfect my song than to sing at random and repeat those phrases which conform to my template as to what the song ought to sound like. Similarly, bowerbirds which, as you know, live in this, in this continent, bowerbirds uh, build a beautiful bower, again, for attracting females. It's a kind of external peacock's tail. Instead of having the, the danger of having a real peacock's tail, which calls attention of predators, what bowerbirds do is they build a bower, which is like the peacock's tail, but is not part of the body, and so it's, it's, it's kind of safer. But if you watch a bowerbird uh, as it's decorating its bower, um, some species do it with snail shells, some species do it with um, blue objects, do blue things, blueberries or beer bottle tops. There are all sorts of things that bowerbirds use to decorate their bowers. And if you watch a bowerbird, many, uh, I, I've never seen one, but I've seen, and probably many of you have too, seen David Attenborough films. It really looks like an artist. It kind of stands back, cocks its head on one side and then darts forward and does a little <laughs> bit of adjusting and then stands back and looks at it just like an artist dabbing the canvas and then standing back and looking at that and then having another go. So once again, it seems to be a case of whatever turns me on is likely to appeal to a female as well. I think that is not a bad description of an aesthetic sense. So I think that there may be certain... Bird song is probably the best example of an aesthetic sense. You may know John Keats's poem "Ode to a Nightingale," where he he compares it to being to being drowned. Really, he says, "My, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as those of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drain as one minute passed and leafy woods had sunk." Keats was drugged by the sound of a nightingale. Keats had the brain of a vertebrate. Not a bird, but nevertheless a vertebrate. And so if Keats could be drugged by the sound of nightingale song, mightn't a nightingale, a female nightingale, be similarly drugged by the sound of a male nightingale singing? And isn't that a kind of aesthetic sense? Keats was obviously a very aesthetic individual, responding in an aesthetic way to the sound of a bird singing and comparing it to being drugged. And I think that, again, is another indication of a kind of aesthetic sense which birds have.
Uh, I think we've got about time for just two quick questions. We're going to do one over there. And can we get a female over this side? Uh, but we're going to start with you. Uh, Professor Dawkins, uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, for your entire life's work. It's uh, an inspiration. Uh, so my question is about epigenetics. So um, this is a term that's thrown around uh, quite a lot, seemingly by people who don't really understand what it means. I've seen definitions from uh, epigenetics is how genes are uh, influenced by their environment to be expressed, but also that uh, it's how uh, intergenerational trauma is passed down. Can you just uh, define uh, it or just uh, explain your stance on epigenetics, please? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It's, it's thrown around with gay abandon, rather unimpressive. Um, uh, epigenetics is, is really just embryology. As the embryo develops, it starts off as an, as an ovum and then it divides and divides and divides and divides and each tissue becomes different and, the, and the liver cells are different from kidney cells, different from muscle cells, different from, from nerve cells. It's the same genes in every kind of cell, but different genes are turned on in different kinds of cells. I mean, liver cells liver-specific genes are turned on. In muscle cells, muscle-specific genes are turned on. That's epigenetics. Now, there have been alleged some experiments in which epigenetic changes in genes have been alleged to be passed on to the next generation. Epigenetic turning on of genes have been alleged to be passed on to the next generation. Um, this may be true, it may be not, not true. It's not a very interesting phenomenon. It's not very widespread. It doesn't persist. It's not evolutionarily important because it's, it doesn't persist for many generations. But it is overhyped. Um, it, it is a, a word that is having its 15 minutes of fame, and I hope it'll soon go away. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Final question. Hey, Dawkins. Um, from all your research and study and working as a biologist and evolutionist over the years, what's the most important thing that you've learned? And secondly, what's your hopes and wishes for humans for the future? So what was the second part? What's your hopes and wishes for humans uh, for the future? H hopes of... Hopes for humans for the future. Hopes of humans for the future. Yes, I believe that was... Was that it, ma'am? Yes. Yes. Do you mean in human evolution or just humans? Just, hu just humans in general. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, are, you, are you here for us? Are you all about it? Well, so, um, What's the most important thing? I've, I, I suppose what I've learned most is, in, most importantly in, in biology, is the, the digital nature of genes and um, the fact that this is the key to taxonomy, to understanding the family tree of animals and, and plants and really everything about them. Life is fundamentally a branch of computer science or information technology. I suppose that's the main thing I've learned. The future hopes for humans my guess is as good as yours. I'm a private citizen. I'm not a, a guru who, who has some kind of insight into the future. Um, I doubt if many gurus do. Um, it, it's, I have, there are clearly grounds for pessimism um, in uh, things like climate change, um, the, the danger of possible epidemics even more severe, much more severe than COVID-19. But I'm not a crystal ball gazer. I'm not a, a good person to look into the future and prognosticate about the future of humanity. Um, the future of life, I think, is probably more secure because life has suffered major catastrophes in the past and has come through, but usually with major changes, major diff different reshuffling of the species that, that are successful. But as, as for the future of, of humans, I suppose there's some reason to suppose that if the next major catastrophe hits, like the, um, the one that killed the dinosaurs, the, the asteroid that collided with Earth, Earth and killed the dinosaurs, there would be reasons to, to hope that some humans might make it through in the way that no dinosaurs, well, actually birds did, they are dinosaurs. We have the technology. We could perhaps survive a major catastrophe of, the catastrophe of that sort. So it's not impossible that in a million years' time there will still be descendants of humans around, which, which it's not a prediction one would make about many species. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up for tonight. First, I'd like to thank all of you guys for parting with your time and money for coming out tonight. It's always very inspiring to see how great masses of people can come out in the name of science and reason and watch an event like this. It's definitely something I'll remember for the rest of my life. Like, you know, the scientific version of seeing a live rendition by Jimi Hendrix or something like that. You know? <laughs> and last but not least, can I offer my sincere appreciation and thanks to you, Mr. Dawkins, for sharing tonight with us. Uh, can we hear it one more time for Mr. Richard Dawkins?
If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends, and leaving a review.